R Richard over there is uh, folks. Oh, we're live on your thing. Oh, so the whole world is seeing this right now. Yeah. Cool. Everyone's getting uh, everyone's getting some behind the scenes thing here. We're all saying hi to each other now. Okay, and, and uh, Richard, say uh, say g g give an intro to say who you are. Dude, we are both hardcore holders. I, I love this. I love Richard. I really do, man. I, I I want him just to go wild today. All right. And then Nick, <laughs> Nick, introduce yourself to the other two guys. Hi, guys. Um, I, I'm a relative newcomer to the scene. Um, hopefully not too new. Uh, I, uh, I'm an academic. Uh, I, I just finished my master's in finance. Um, and uh, I spent the whole year trying to perfect some some tools to uh, to basically give investors better data on uh, what's going on with uh, with cryptocurrencies right now. Uh, and I, I actually uh, I'm working on publishing my dissertation, which is about governance in crypto assets, uh, which is a pretty hot topic right now. So you're no newbie, man. You you got it. Your Twitter feed is freaking awesome, and that's all linked to below. So we're gonna we're gonna start on the on the show. My show is gonna start in a second, um, and we're gonna go. Uh, I'll just introduce all of you real quick and do my little spiel, and uh, then uh, we'll we'll start with Richard and about this China thing and stuff, and then just go around from there. There'll be all sorts of topics. It's laid back, as uh, most of you know, so feel free to ask each other questions. And I think this is kind of cool that on Richard's stream, people are getting a little behind the scenes of how I set this thing up usually. All right, um, so everyone, let's uh, be silent for a second. I gotta just put one thing up here. Where's my screen share? Oh God, there's so much. All right. Yeah, hang on. I'll tell, I'll say when we're starting. Right. Soon enough, we'll close this. Uh, where's my all right so i'm pushing start and we'll be live in a second so sh 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 hello everyone this is adam meister the bitcoin meister the disrupt meister welcome to this week in bitcoin today is september the 8th 2017 buy and hold strong hand <laughs> all right remember check out my uh, link section below we got important links to all the guests to the crypto hw wallet.com you can get your uh, leather case for your storage device let's let's oh man i just messed up everything Shit. <laughs> oh my god i said i i God almighty, that really was bad. I, I pushed stop. How do I? <laughs> Crap. Now we're only on we're only on Richard's channel. That has never happened before. Rats. And I don't curse on this thing. See, everybody, this is the reason that we believe in decentralized systems, because no <laughs> single party can fail and bring everything down. That's why we believe in redundancy. Yeah, well, hang on a second. I just like to say pound that like button. Yeah, no. Smash but, uh, that like button. Can we get 20,000 likes in the next 10 minutes, guys? <laughs> dude, dude, how do I get back on the... How can I restart that? Oh, God, I'm going to have to... I've, I've literally seen warnings that you can't restart it, so I don't know. I think you have to just use live instead of event. So instead of using event, if you had one scheduled, you have to use just live and give people a new link. I don't think you can restart an event stream. God almighty. Google's fucked some things up, man. I know, man. Everyone's getting the behind the scenes today. I mean, the other like, options to just, just feed leave. all your visitors to my channel because my shit's working good. 
Yeah, well, we're, we're, I mean, we can do it on Richards and then... We're already doing it. Like, you're live are. now, man. <laughs> this is all like... We're, we're doing it. We're doing it on yours, but I'm losing this whole thing. I want to have it on mine. I know. Um, well, Adam, why don't we just all leave you, and, and re, you know, rejoin us? Send a new link to join. Um, it's okay. We'll just start uh, five, ten minutes later. All right. So, Richard, you keep on the – I guess Richard will stay over here. I'll just chat until you guys give me a new link, I guess. Okay, I'm going to I'm going to send you a new just link. Just use live in a view instead of event and then you can like come in and out in and out all you like. Okay. So you click events, it's the top one that says like stream now. Yeah. Hang on. Let's right. do quick Google Hangouts, it'll work. I'll mute you okay. guys and just talk to my chat for now. Yeah, good idea. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right, chat. What's going on, guys? Got any smart people questions in here? I think we're going to be like uh, 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds delayed because of the 4K stream. Hope you're enjoying that you can see this in four times more resolution for no particular reason than I bought the equipment and I want to use it. So that's what's up. I'm going to scroll up and chat and see if any of you guys had anything interesting to say here. Adam and Richard, two Bitcoin experts that aren't experts at all. Thank you very much. Literally knows nothing more than an average dude that stumbled upon Bitcoin in 2015. All right. Richard is a quality bullshit artist. I like this chat. This is good stuff. Why do I watch, you may ask? Answer, Richard is a quality bullshit artist. I guess that's when your meme doesn't work the first time. You like see if you can get responses by like making it better. Well done, Joey. Keep trying. You like to hear yourself talk, don't you? Nobody gives a fine fuck. I do, actually. I wish my voice was deeper, so... Oh, well. Uh, let's go on down. This guy has mental issues. I assume you're talking about somebody in chat. China banned soft cheese today. True story. All right. I've, I've never been a fan of soft cheese. I like hard cheese that's been melted. That's pretty awesome. France tried to ban stinky cheese in the 1700s. Chat, you guys suck. This, these comments are neither funny nor intellectual. Like, up your chat game, guys. I'm going to scroll down a bit and just hope that it, it worked out better here. Richard, Miami Vice it up today. Thank you. Uh, shirt is nice. Put on a short sleeve over a t-shirt. Well, I could have worn like a long sleeve. with A short sleeve jacket would have been stupider, right? Basically, I'm tired of sweating in these live streams because I have to turn the lights up and the lights are hot. So what you learn about lighting is that incandescent lights are the best near black body radiation lights that we have. They produce the best red color. When you use LEDs or fluorescents, they get too green and blues are uh, the like, vi like ultraviolet, neon, and uh, reds just disappear. Yep. One that's in yeah, I my... can hear you. Can you all leave my uh, my Give Google Hangout link? now? Just yeah, just everybody hang up on me, and I'll reconnect to all you guys. Just okay. Uh, but just but Richard, you can keep doing your. Sure. Your... Yep. Okay. I'm waiting for a new link. All right. Cool. Ciao. Right, you'll... Yeah. So I'm just gonna leave that uh, that window open until I get a new good link. <sighs> Scrolling down, chat. Sad chat. No good questions chat. How do you write comments without moving? I use my mind and telekinesis, obviously. Wait, Richard, Richard, yep. can you just like, totally hang up on sure. mine? Just okay. get, out, get it. out of this of mine. Yeah. Get, get, yeah. Exit I, my thing. I did it. Didn't I? No, no. We're, we're in I'm mine still. there. Still. Is, Sorry. Yeah. This Doing it again. I guess I'm bad at interweb. See, that's the reason I didn't want to do that, Adam, because now they're reading confidential communications. And I don't like that crap. Let's see if I can pull open another window here. I'm just going to have to wait on a link. Sorry, bra. Actually, I'll just be smart and I'll do this. Bloop. Oh, who's a genius over here? Back to chat. Dope suit homie. 
Richard Hart is straight savage. Thank you, sir. Smile. Buy the dip, baby. Free coins, cheap coins. Thank you, China Fud. Damn, chat, you guys are the worst. Come on. I want to be Richard's stylist. Please ask Adam to stop interrupting. How is that not an awesome question? I understand that you are a Bitcoin maximalist, but at least get some Dogecoin too. No. Let me check, see if I got a new link from homie. Gonna message him. Back to my chat. Tell us about the price of BTC. Well, as is so often in news from China, you get a rumor from somebody close to some agency that can do good or bad things. And you're two layers removed. So you're really three layers removed. So first you're getting a, an, an incomplete signal from the agency which is being proxied by an unnamed source, which is being proxied through a reporter, which is being proxied through your Google Translate or whoever you're having translate for you, unless you're a native Chinese speaker. So if you include the Google Translation, you're about four layers removed from what is rumored action. And they used to do this all the time a few years ago, ban, unban, ban, unban, ban, unban, and there was no rhyme or reason or predictability or intelligence that came of it. And if you've seen the Bitcoin price, they obviously left it in a state of unban because, you know, nothing's banned. Like the only, the only recent thing that has been actually banned is ICOs in China. And even that, you know, only some portion of that was written. You know, I, I, I like the Western style of law where the only law you need to comply with is the written stuff and you don't have to worry about translated reporter rumors from people near a thing rumor from people that can change their mind back and forth it's pretty much garbage so i would not be surprised like i i doubt we'll even get to 4k today and uh if we do hit 4k i don't think we'll stay more than a minute under it so like i think i tweeted out that my guess is that like a minute or two low at 3980 was my guess. Now, mind you, this is crypto, right? So anything's possible, right? 20% drawdowns occur, not that infrequently. And I think 29% off of today's like early day price would be something like 3850. But I don't think that, uh, that we're gonna go that low, so. If you're gonna buy and you like buying dips and you like free money, I I think that uh, somewhere, you know, in the 4K area seems pretty legit. Because even if like, even if China completely dropped out like entirely, so what? You still got peer to peer trade. You've still got like every other good thing that's going on. So I I don't. I mean, I'll put it to you this way. They already have laws against exchanging currency and it doesn't appear to stop capital flight. So if they add new laws against exchanging virtual currencies, then whatever mechanisms are used to trade the already illegal normal currencies will be used to trade uh, crypto. So what coins do I own? I will tell you what I like. I like Bitcoin. I like Byteball. You got handed them for free if you're a coin holder. And uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Everything else seems to me uh, technically stupider. And if you're talking about technicals, like the reason I like Byteball is because it doesn't use blocks and it doesn't use miners and the user interface is super good and the distribution was fair. So the downside the downside to the Bipol system is that there's like a single Russian dude in charge of it that's in charge of most of the coins. So, you know, that's a giant risk. But like technologically, the project seems pretty awesome. 
And I think you also have, you know, just the general risks of, uh, of having a, uh, you have the general risks of having a federated system because they use trusted witnesses and you can choose your own witnesses and such. So like I would normally say witnesses are, you know, a terrible, stupid idea, but right now there's so few, uh, there's so few attacks in the space against like the network level architecture. So you get, you get attacks against the wallets and I, you rarely see attacks against, against like pools and the actual like network infrastructure. Like you haven't seen a civil attack against nodes. I don't know why, like if it were really like a hostile environment, you would expect more of that. So I, I'm starting in the short term to feel a little bit more okay with federated systems. And as soon as real attacks start showing up, federated systems aren't going to be good enough anymore. All right, I'm going to try and rejoin the, the stream and turn the, uh, the stream back on. Hello. All right. How we'll just wait. We'll just wait for uh, Rocky and then we'll start it again. All right. Do you want me to just like mute you until then and keep talking to my chat or do you want me to leave you not muted? It's up to you. I, I can be on me. I'm not going to say anything. So yeah, keep talking to your chat. I'll just say, okay. Hey, we're going to start once, once Rocky gets in the room. All right. So I'm, I'm going to be transmitting your audio and video so that, you know, so okay. you're live now until you ask me to unlive you. Yeah. All right. Reading chat. Is yeah. And everybody, I, I tweeted out, well, I'll mute you. Yeah, I tweeted out the new link. So it, uh, it question in chat is, is proof of stake bullshit or will there ever be a good reason to stop mining like Bitcoin does today? If you, so proof of stake doesn't work unless it never gets attacked and then could work for a while. All right. I'm going to come over. I'm here. We're going to have oh, oh, ready when you are. So everything. Okay. I'm pushing start. Hello everyone. This is Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister, the Disrupt Meister. Sorry about the technical difficulties we had before. Welcome to this week in Bitcoin. Today is September the 8th, 2017. And yeah, you can get your crypto HW wallet uh, stuff, your leather case in the link section below. I'm going to have to update that soon. We just had to come back on air. I clicked the doomsday button here and YouTube does not let you uh, restart from your previous 30 second show. So anyway, I it is in a very, such an exciting day that I, I, I clicked on the doomsday button and now we're back and we've got Richard Hart, We've got Rocky Palumbo and we got Nick Carter coming to you. And we're going to address the big story of the day. First, the rumors coming out of China that they're banning Bitcoin exchanges or cryptocurrency exchanges. They're closing the cryptocurrency exchanges. Is this really even happening? The price drops yet again, 400 points um, on China rumors. I mean, we're so used. I'm so used to this by now. It's just China killed Bitcoin again. So Richard, what is, what is going on here? So earlier today, there was a huge price dump on BitMEX and it went from about 46 to 44 in a minute. And uh, everyone was like, what's going on? And so everyone started messaging all of their contacts. And what appeared was an article from China that when translated through Google Translate stated that the ICO ban was just a first volley, a first attack, that there would be further regulations imposed and that all cryptocurrency exchanges would be banned. However, peer-to-peer -peer trade and blockchain technology would be unaffected as long as you didn't, you know, care about exchanging locally. So as is commonly the news out of China, it is not a government official speaking. It is not a written policy. It is a Google translated reporter reporting what an unnamed source near something may have said. And so oftentimes is the case with China, 
they ban, unban, ban, unban, ban, unban. And they did this 10, 15 times over the years when Bitcoin was like the only crypto around. And it obviously ended in a state of being unbanned, which is why the price is, you know, globally high, right? It's not like lower or particularly higher in China because it's unbanned, right? There's a lot of infrastructure there, tons of mining, tons of exchanges, tons of everything. So you can't trust what rumors you hear out of China and you almost can't trust even like stronger, stronger sourced rumors because we, we couldn't trust them in the past. This is why in the West, the only laws you have to follow are the ones that are written. And, you know, it seems like in China, if, uh, if a government agency kind of mentions something that everyone insta dumps and does the best they can to not, to not get like hacked up, which is an interesting system. You know, it's, uh, I'm not sure that it's much better because I don't think China outperforms America anywhere except standardized testing and I guess advanced manufacturing now, but that's, you know, we have the opportunity to recompete in that if we, if we decide to spend money on it. So I, I believe that, you know, if you look at the volume, the amount of volume that was dumped and I don't have time to watch all the exchanges. I was just watching max cause it was first. Um, and if you're going to trade, it, it's good to use margin to reduce your counterparty risk. I tell everyone not to trade, but if you're going to, it's better to have less coins on an exchange than, than have the exchange disappear with all of them. Um, on, on max, the volume indicated that there was only maybe $8 million of dump down from 4,400 to 4,200. And that's, you know, just one or two big guys like playing around. That's not, that's not a big move for, I don't, I don't think it's a big move. I wouldn't have been surprised to just see that price today anyway, you know, like I wouldn't even add to, I wouldn't even buy more at that price. Right. Like it's not, I, I don't, I'm not impressed with the move. Um, and I'm not impressed with the volume and I'm not impressed with the source of the rumor. However, <laughs> you know, uh, we'll see. I, I still tell people about it because let them make their own decisions. If I, if I have a hot rumor that I have like information about faster than other people, it's my job to like, get it out there and, and give people my properly qualified, you know, I, I heard this and I think this with this degree of certainty and here's why, and then let them make their own decisions based on that. It, I think that if you sell Bitcoin or crypto on news, you will get wrecked because most people do not care about the news. Like for instance, Vitalik started Ethereum three price barely moved. Uh, China really banned ICOs, which is like devastating to the Ethereum ecosystem because that's Ethereum's only use case is ICOs. It's the only reason anyone has ever bought an Ethereum is to get into an ICO. And if ICOs were for, if Chinese ICOs were 40% of Ethereum volume, then it's a massive, massive harm to Ethereum, but the price was only slightly impacted. Right. And like, so I, I don't suggest trading at all. And I don't suggest trading on news and I don't suggest trusting, uh, China, you should go long and hold. And if you want a little bit of extra margin, take a little bit and go two X or five X long. There's a link in my channel if you need it. Uh, and that's it. Like don't trade. You'll lose. You're the last guy to know, you know, why didn't you know ahead? I didn't know ahead. You're not going to know ahead. So, you know, you're going to get wrecked by these random things. Don't trade. Exactly. Well, uh, thank, thank you very much, Richard, for that opening. That puts everybody up to date on what's going on. And yeah, I'm a buy and hold guy to pound that like button, people. 90% of the time, traders lose. So I wanted to read this tweet that kind of sums up everything. Uh, it's from Beautyon. I'll link to it eventually. Um, it was linked to in the original uh, video for this that got cut off. Uh, volatility on news from China shows that Bitcoin markets are still very immature as immature as the men day trading on the exchanges. So yeah, there, there's, there's a lot of people who call themselves traders and on these exchanges. I mean, I want exact, they're just panickers. They buy into every rumor. It's just, it's the wild, wild west out there. I, I've said it a million times, don't be a trader, man. It is 90% of the time you're gonna lose. Uh, but just buy and hold is what I do. I love it, it's fun. You get to you get to sit back and just know in the long term it's going to be okay. At can least I, that's my opinion. Can Nick, I mention? Go, go ahead. Oh yes, Richard. I was just no, going to no, say like, we dumped from gonna... forty six to forty two, and now we're at like forty four. So, like the, the yeah, dumps already half the other. Over, so, 
not yeah. very exciting. But we'll see. This is we'll see what the real news is. Nick, what is what is your opinion on this? You two, Nick's got a great Twitter out there, and in his, in his recent tweets, he's he's been saying like, did China even really say this or not? So Nick, what's going on? Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, thanks for having me on. It's uh, it's great that uh, that you give me this chance. Um, my opinion, a Chinese uh, trader friend of mine texted me earlier and told me uh, Chinese regulators like to test the waters um, prior to making big moves. So am I of the opinion that this is entirely fabricated? Maybe not. Um, the, the, the sources that I'm seeing, um, there's basically two big outlets the news came out on, uh, Kai Chen and the China Securities Journal. Um, they're fairly credible. Right. I, the source may be questionable, um, but is it an outright fabrication? I think that's pretty unlikely. Um, my friend who is uh, Chinese and he, he's sort of a, he, he likes to trade told me this is very common. You saw it in the uh, in the equity markets um, before the regulators put limits on margin. Um, so, uh, you know, maybe this is just a precursor. Uh, and, you, you know, the exchanges the Chinese exchanges haven't heard anything yet from the regulators. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people are calling this out as FUD and fake news. There's possibly more to it. Do I think it's a, a reason to sell your entire Bitcoin stack? Of course not. You know, um, a, a lot of my smartest friends, um, academics, are absolutely terrible traders, right? Um, and I wouldn't recommend trading on any news like this. I absolutely agree with, uh, with Richard's analysis. Um, I think this may have some legs to it, but ultimately, what percentage of, of global trading volume is China? I couldn't tell you, uh, but it's definitely not the 90% that people thought it was back in uh, 2016. Right? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I don't, I don't think they make up that big of the market anyway. So we, we always overreact to everything China. When, when will the community get over syndrome here where, where they must overreact to everything China or is this just a way of speculators playing everyone uh, they, they'll always start to sell start to cause panics when they hear any news out of China I don't know well, I, I know uh, I know that for ethereum China is 40 percent of the ISO purchasing because I've personally spoken with people that have had multi hundred million dollar ICOs and they personally told me in person that 40 percent of their sales volume in their ICO was Chinese and Vitalik speaks fucking Mandarin. So Bitcoin, like Bitcoin might not be affected by China so much, but Ethereum is 100% for sure. Uh, that is a very good, interesting point. I'm glad you brought up the statistics. I wanted to point out that this whole dump that's been going on for the last two hours, it affected every single crypto, every cryptocurrency drop. So it was just the, the, the people heard, oh, China's going to shut down exchanges. Uh, let's sell all our cryptocurrency. That's what it looks like has happened. But again, it's it's this is speculation. Even if China does do that, who cares that there's a whole world out there? Think long term, people. Rocky, what is what's your opinion on that? All this. Let's get to the great Rocky. Well, what I read was that um, the Chinese exchanges stopped allowing fiat deposits but continued to allow fiat withdrawals. So this, you know, put a fear into everybody over there and thought, well, I better get, you know, my withdrawals out while I can. And it just kind of, you know, cascaded from there. But, you know, it's hard getting good information if you're in China. <laughs> We're gonna have to wait a while to really find out what's going on over there. Yeah, uh, definitely everyone. We've had some technical difficulty. We're back on schedule, pound that like button. Pound that like button and uh, spread the word that we're over here. Uh, I I can't see. I don't think I have my chat open, so sorry about. Or maybe maybe I do. I, I'm still a little foot tumbled over here. Let's talk to uh, Rocky. Let's let's transition into Segwit. Um, it's obviously been implemented. It uh, addresses are out there. More people are using it. What is what's going on? You wanted to tell us some stuff about Segwit. And then we'll get Richard to reply to uh, what you have to say about what's going on with SegWit, because I've got some specific questions for Richard also. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, I screen, I'm screen sharing now. Uh, are you? Yeah. Are you? Yeah, I was asking. Okay, okay, cool. 
Okay, so uh, as most people know, we got SegWit activated on August 23rd. So shortly after that, within a, a day or two, uh, you know, my, uh, mining poles uh, started mining blocks bigger than, than one meg. Um, Bitfury was the first, and then five or six came uh, on board shortly after that. But it wasn't until August 31st that Ampol started mining uh, blocks bigger than one meg. And it wasn't until five days ago um, on September 3rd that via BTC started mining blocks um, with one uh, bigger than one meg. Um, and um, what's interesting here on this screen shot or this screen I'm sharing here is that, um, you know, our beloved uh, Roger, uh, more recently known as Bitcoin Lucifer, uh, has been uh, refusing to increase the maximum block size on his mining software. The miners have control over how big a block they, they can mine, although they can't go over the maximum, they can still control, you know, you know, under the maximum. So um, even today, uh, Bitcoin.com, which is owned by um, Roger, is still mining blocks uh, only up to one meg. So he hasn't uh, changed his maximum block size uh, attribute to uh, four megs. They could they could set it to four megs now. Core put out a memo to all the miners saying change your maximum block size allowed from one meg to four megs because SegWit will allow up to four megs. Um, so him refusing to do this, that's the big question. I mean, basically, he's a hypocrite. He's been going around for the better part of two years saying he wants bigger blocks. Now he can mine bigger blocks and he's refusing to mine bigger blocks while he's saying in his uh, Coinbase here that he supports the New York agreement, which means SegWit now and a two meg hard fork later. And he's also signaling here for BU, uh, Bitcoin Unlimited, which means unlimited block size eventually. And so, you know, all of his screaming about bigger blocks, bigger blocks, bigger blocks. Now he can mine bigger blocks and he's refusing to mine bigger blocks. Um, but the good news is it doesn't matter. He's a small mining pool, um, comparatively speaking. Also, GB miners, they're in the same boat here. They refuse to um, change that setting on their mining software. The big one is BTC Top. Um, they haven't changed their setting to four megs either. Um, but they're right now out of the past 300 and some blocks. Um, let's see if we can take a look here. I think it was... Yeah, 365 blocks. That's about two and a half days worth of mining. Uh, BTC Top has mined more, uh, found more blocks than anybody else. So they're a big mining pool and they're refusing to do it. But again, the good news is I don't believe uh, it's really necessary for all the pools to start doing it because once the wallets kick into gear and get with the SegWit program and release um, new versions of their wallets that have SegWit in their GUI, that um, you'll see these green numbers here that are just a hair over one meg, you'll see these start to really grow to, you know, from uh, um, 1,001, I think I saw like a 1,000, here's a 1,011. Um, these are going to grow to, you know, 1,100, 1,200, 1,300, and, uh, but we need the, the wallets to support it. That's all we're really waiting for now. Um, so that's about all I wanted to say about that. Okay. Now, Richard, you probably have some replies there, but I wanted to make sure, Richard, that you mentioned, I've heard that you, you've you said that there really are hardly any Bitcoin transactions that are actually going on. Um, and, 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 that, and sure, so why do we even need if you If you want me to explain we, this, you ain't gonna like the answer. I'll do it, but huh? uh, Bitcoin holders ain't gonna like the answer. Of course, I mean, I, okay, we'll get I'm gonna it. Do so, it so I, okay. So there ain't, that, there ain't no transaction volume. It's all spam. Yeah, well, okay, that is a very, that's very important, but can address, if he said anything about SegWit that you wanted to add to, please, please add. Sure, to SegWit's great. It stops transaction malleability, gets Lightning working faster, makes it easier for new people to develop on the ecosystem. Whereas a lot of Fudsters would have told you it was harder. It's not, it's easier now. Uh, it gives us, you know, instant savings to anyone that activates it in their wallet. And it frees up all of our political lobbying power and uh, developer power to work on the next things. You know, the sooner we get done with the thing that's been on the roadmap for a very long time, 
then the sooner we can move on to the next thing, which is Schnorr signatures, which is more space savings and makes anonymity and ring signatures cheaper and easier and mast, which I can't even remember all the things it does off the top of my head. And we've also got uh, a lot of things in the pipeline to make Bitcoin work better. And you can't do those if you're still fighting the SegWit battle. So, yes, it's it's good that battle is over. I want you. So you're going to address in a second the that that one issue. Sure. But I want first <laughs> first I want to, Nick. Do you have any uh, SegWit thoughts? Um, I uh, I'm I'm very pleased it finally went through. Um, and uh, from a uh, from a perspective, of what I've been working on for the last three months or so, which is. Uh, trying to codify the way that uh, governance works on not only Bitcoin, but other coins um, as well. I'm very pleased because I think it's great evidence that um, economic nodes and users actually do have some governance power within the system, um, which was something hitherto people sort of disbelieved, right? But mostly uh, there was this common belief that miners were somehow the, the overlords of Bitcoin um, or that the core, if you looked in the academic literature, you'd see that, uh, Many academics alleged that core developers controlled Bitcoin entirely um, in this sort of very narrow technocratic elite. Um, and I think both of those notions have been disabused in the last few months. Um, I, you know, I've got my, my UASF hat right here. Um, I, I fully endorse that movement. I um, hope you guys did as well. Um, and I think Segret, you know, the ending of that intransigence it shows us that economic nodes and not businesses and not miners and you know not necessarily developers that economic nodes do uh, they are the ultimate arbiter of power within the system um, as for its technological merits i'm probably not uh, equipped to speak on that um, but i would just say that it is a thoroughly gratifying event um, and i think it really set the tone for the way things will go from now on Awesomeness. I wanted to say, everyone, pound that like button. I can see you in the chat. I wanted to thank Ken Bozak for uh, sending me a super chat donation and also Dan Williams. There, uh, Dan is complimenting Ken Bozak over there. And also in the chat, they're saying this is another China hoax. Who, well, who knows? It's China FUD, to say the very least. This situation that's going on now is China FUD. If you have a strong hand and you're a longtime holder, this a long time thinker. This this doesn't matter. It's just an, another day in the game. So I do want to address since we do since Richard is on here and Richard is controversial. And Richard's going to say, you know, what comes to mind uh, on his mind. He's not scared of anything. Uh, he has pointed out that there not not that many people use Bitcoin. Rich, elaborate on this. Do people actually use cryptocurrency? So I'll I'll just start off with the most terrifying figure is that if you chart all the Bitcoin wallets that you can identify in the blockchain, it's all publicly available. There's something like 5.1 million that have over a dollar and that's it. So that means one of two things, either there's only 5.1 million users, which is obviously not true. I think Coinbase has 20 Damn. million, some number of millions on their own. And that's just one single American exchange. So what is much more likely the case is that many holders and purchasers of Bitcoin don't hold their own keys and instead have funny money, fiat, IOU, credit tokens on an exchange, which is fun in games until the exchange fails or has regulatory problems or is hacked, which I believe is an inevitability. I believe with 100% certainty, every exchange will be hacked always because it's the most profitable hack anyone can perform if you assign value to like not having to hide the money. If you like do normal criminal computer stuff, you can get a bunch of bank wires, but now you've got to keep the money somehow. Bitcoin doesn't have that problem. You get to keep the money. So it's like a the price increase plus computer security being a joke in general, plus you can keep your winnings without any effort makes attacking exchanges insanely profitable. So right now, 5.1 million addresses with over a dollar in them is a gigantic problem. And it means a lot of people are exposing themselves to exchange risk that they don't need. And it also means we have a lot of room to grow, which is pretty cool. Uh, retail adoption is an absolute joke. Uh, you know, you're going to eat 
more costs in the bid ask spread and the purchase fees from an ATM or from a local Bitcoins transaction just to get your Bitcoin that you'll never recover on the other side selling them. So no intelligent person would purchase Bitcoin to actually use them unless they were availing themselves of the pseudo anonymity and like light ability to transact anonymously. You still have to do things to be protected. If you're, if you're using the coin for that, then it makes sense to pay a premium, right? Like if you're a dark net market guy, um, then it makes sense to pay premium. But if you're any other normal human being, the only use case that makes sense to purchase Bitcoin for is to buy it and hold it as a replacement for gold. And that's enough. You know, if Bitcoin is just a settlement layer and it's just a replacement for digital gold, that is more than enough value. That's 20,000 a coin minimum at 5% of gold's value. And that's without all of the extra possible future growth and alternative use cases such as dark nets that would be just 5% of gold's you know hold value so imagine how high the price will go when you can use it as a currency imagine how pr- high the price will go when uh, the first nation state adopts it imagine how high the price will go when other little cryptos die from security problems or lack of circular economic uh, interaction like there's a whole bunch of amazing, you know, we've got the best team, the longest track record, the most secure software, a network that's always up. You know, the Ethereum network's down often. You can't transact. The wallets turn their wallets off. Uh, the, the exchanges turn their wallets off. Geth and Parity disagree with each other. Huge code bloat. They've got a bigger blockchain, but magically now are still mining smaller blocks than Bitcoin is. So, you know, Bitcoin is the best cryptocurrency that exists and is, is likely to be the best cryptocurrency that will ever exist. However, it's nowhere near its potential currently, which in my opinion, makes it a great purchase. So it's bad, but it's getting better and the price is gonna go up. So that's great. Okay, that wasn't wasn't too scary there, man. That wasn't wasn't too scary. Do do any of the panel members have uh, uh, any uh, thoughts on what Richard just said? I think it's a fantastic point. Um, and if you look at the way that Wall Street folks evaluate Bitcoin, they look at retail adoption and they say, look, this is terrible. Nobody accepts Bitcoin. But, you know, this is probably the year when people realize it's not necessarily for retail use in its current state. And it's a real mistake to value it on that basis. Um, if any of you follow Ari Paul on Twitter, you know, he runs a large fund now, um, really influential. He says the same exact stuff. It's an unseizable store of value, first and foremost. Everything else is secondary. If it can fulfill that use case, that's good enough. Uh, and you know, Bitcoin's network value is sort of approaching the amount that's held in uh, ETFs that track gold. We're not far away from that. Um, if you think it can recapture the entire value of the gold outstanding in the world, that's about eight trillion dollars. So you can easily do the math. Uh, you know, um, ultimately, I don't think Bitcoin will be particularly useful for private transactions. We've seen blockchain analysis has become very sophisticated in the last year, uh, incredibly sophisticated. Um, you know, the, the website I run, Coinmetrics, which uh, seeks to give analytics to folks to figure out what kind of transaction volume we're looking at. Uh, so this answers the question of what sort of actual on-chain transaction volume occurs. We do a little bit of blockchain analysis for that to figure out which transactions are real and which ones are change outputs. Um, it's very, very simple to de-anonymize Bitcoin. Uh, there was a report just the other week that, you know, the cookies that um, leak your information whenever you do a Bitcoin transaction online, that can de-anonymize your account. So unless you're using Tor um, and you bought your Bitcoins on local Bitcoins, you know, anonymously, you're basically out of luck, right? And you're gonna to have to go towards one of the privacy cryptos. Um, you know, the, the biggest Bitcoin mixer shut down, right? Um, and the biggest Bitcoin exchange without KYC AML also shut down. Um, it might be back up now, but basically, you know, if you wanna buy drugs online, Bitcoin is not the way to do it. That's <laughs> a be- beautiful conclusion there. I, I like to hear that. Can, I, can I, I add also... something onto that anonymity part? Oh yeah, please. So. Everyone that has a problem with the old go to jail thing, they almost, if you look at like what happened in the individual cases, they always have giant OPSEC problems outside the currency. And the currency is just an afterthought. You know, I I can only think of maybe one instance, 
maybe, and it's just a rumor that I didn't look into, of the currency itself being the source of someone's problems. Everyone's doing something illegal and getting caught problems starts with bad browsers, bad location, bad name leakage, reusing of passwords, like all of those things. And it hasn't like, so even though technically against like a nation state attacker, you don't have anonymity with Bitcoin, most people never ever have a problem with it. And the investigators uh, times are full prosecuting all the idiots that screwed up everywhere else. So, I mean, I'm just saying it's, it is actually today useful enough for an anonymity, although it may not always be the case. Excellent. I also want to go back to a point that you said before that uh, all all exchanges will be hacked eventually. If if that's true, if that's not true, that's an attitude everyone should have, though, because you should control your own private key. You should control your own private address. This is not about relying on third parties. I've said it many times. People have tried to argue with me saying, oh, man, I keep my I keep my uh, coin at an exchange. I was able to get Bcash right away. And they give these little examples. And then I say, well, if you were at BTC dash E, you would have lost everything. You had you kept everything there. I mean, so the, the bottom line is people should. If, it, if, if your exchange eventually gets hacked, if it doesn't, you should just think it is control your private key. Security is something that is so important here. Uh, Rocky, uh, we said a mouthful since we last talked to you. What, what do you, any, any opinions, anything you have to say here? Yeah, well, you know, I see a Bitcoin user as anyone who uses Bitcoin, no matter what they're using it for. If, if you uh, are buying it to hold long term, you're still using it as a store of value. It doesn't matter that you're, you're not making transactions every day. You're still using Bitcoin. Um, or if you're using it for transactions uh, once a day, once a week, once a month, you're using Bitcoin. Or even a, a retail store that accepts Bitcoin and turns that into fiat instantly, they're still using Bitcoin. They're using Bitcoin to attract new customers. So I see all of these uh, situations as people using Bitcoin. But as far as retail goes, um, you know, here in the United States, it is rather low. Um, you know, I am pretty confident that's going to change here in the coming years as Bitcoin gets more popular. You know, it's kind of the, you know, the egg before the chicken thing. You know, the retailers don't want to accept it till a lot of their customers have it. And the customers don't want it till the retailer accepts it. So we got that going on. And also here in the States, you know, our fiat for as bad as our system is, our fiat with the credit cards and everything works pretty good to places, uh, other places around the world. But uh, I hear a lot of reports about other places around the world. You, you walk down the street there and you see lots of uh, businesses that have the signs that they accept it, like this one here. This doesn't say accepted here. This says traded here. This is back from my trading days. I used to put out this sign on the table. But um, uh, yeah, so, you know, I hear that you walk down um, in Tokyo, you walk down the street and, you know, a lot of the merchants there have these signs in the window. They're accepting Bitcoin. It's just not here in the States yet. It's mostly used for, uh, you know, a store of value here. I, I want to say, um, you know, beforehand, Richard brought up, uh, you, Richard, you're pretty critical of Ethereum. Uh, on a certain level, yep. but I want to ex I want to expand things into the newbie factor. We've got so many newbies joining the space who are pumping up these ICOs, and it's just it becomes more apparent every week uh, that they're a, a huge part of the market, and it's just something we're going to have to deal with. There's just a lot of irrational uh, exuberance out there, just pumping up all sorts of things. So. Richard, I want you to start the discussion here amongst the panel. What is up with the newbie factor here? Is it is it something we should be concerned about? Is it something we should embrace? Are they skewing the market? What's what's your opinion? Most ICOs are terrible scams, and most of the teams that are getting funded have never done anything good before. And the more money you give them, the more outrageous their claims, the more likely they are to fail. So you've got people being given too much money who don't know how to use it properly that are trying to do the wrong things that the market won't reward anyway. So it's bad on a bunch of levels because when either the, uh, people trying to do the thing, stop trying to do it, or, uh, they get regulated out of existence, or they find out that 
they uh, were incapable of doing it or the market said, no, we don't want it, the prices are going to come down. And or when enough ICOs dump their Ethereum and there's a race for the exits, Ethereum goes to zero. Ethereum was zero not so long ago. You know, the Ethereum foundation was almost out of money. And then uh, with enough pumping from guys like Lubin, you eventually end up with uh, a lot of money and an ecosystem, which apparently has produced no successful distributed applications whatsoever. And is just a fancy way to, uh, to, I guess, play stupidity lottery. So, I mean, it's all fun and games until the music stops and people start searching for chairs. But when, when the race for the exits happens, you're going to be the last to find out about it because the, you know, a hundred people that hold the vast majority of Ethereum because all the idiots handed it to them, uh, you know, are going to know last, right? So for the same reason that Bitcoin price dumped 200 bucks today without you being warned about it is the same reason Ethereum will dump harder without you being warned about it. I mean, this has already happened. So GDAX flash crashed when some Ethereum holder hit sell, sold the whole order book and people's stop losses got executed at a penny, right? So you then you have to learn to do things like don't use stop market orders, you use stop limit orders, right? And even that isn't a perfect solution. So Ethereum is less retail adoption, more tax service, surface, competing implementations, smart contracts are worth nothing. A smart contract is just a program, that's all it is. And programs are only useful for manipulating inputs. And inputs in a contract are data, like stock prices. Like, oh, we're gonna make a smart contract that, to trade stocks. Well, if you noticed earlier this year, the New York Stock Exchange published published publicly incorrect stock prices for all of their stocks. So imagine if your smart contract was trusting the New York Stock Exchange to tell the truth about their prices. It might have been NASDAQ, but I think it was nice. Your contract would be screwed, your system would be screwed, and then some god would have to go back and fix the chain, which breaks the whole thing. So the reason that Bitcoin has existed for nine years or eight years and had only one successful app currency is because that's what it's good at. And the reason Ethereum has lasted for as long as it has and has no successful apps whatsoever is because it only has one successful use case, which is for a, a more standardized way to, uh, to issue new tokens. Now I am working on a token and I am going to use that ecosystem, which I disparage so very much but uh, I'm going to do it as little as possible because I see it as a quite bad thing. Oh, excellent. Nick, Nick, what, Nick, you analyze crypto assets. Uh, I'm sure you have some thoughts on what Richard just said. Um, and you might have some thoughts on some other altcoins too. So I'll give you the floor there. All right. So um, I, uh, I'm starting a research desk um, basically um, to deliver quote unquote fundamental research. Um, to, um, to an institutional crowd, right? Because there's a huge demand for that. Um, me and my partner disagree very stridently about Ethereum, right? I'm, a, I'm an Ethereum skeptic. I basically agree with Richard's analysis there. Um, and, and he likes Ethereum. Um, I don't see any way the Ethereum, I don't want to call it a bubble, but you know, Ethereum's inflated price, I don't see how it can be unwound without harming a lot of retail investors and basically doing a huge amount of damage to the system. Um, at large, you know, it, it's, I think it's fairly toxic um, and it's, it's contagious, right? So it affects Bitcoin as well, even though Bitcoin has virtually nothing to do with, uh, with the ICO fever. Um, I mean, you know, you can buy some ICOs with Bitcoin, but that, you know, it's not the, the principal asset there. And, uh, and Richard is, is absolutely right. You know, I was looking back at the first ICOs, seeing have any of them delivered a product, you know, a, a beta that works, that has, you know, 5 million active users. And the answer is simply no, right? You know, what's one of the long, longest running and best funded projects uh, aside from Ethereum, something like Augur maybe? And uh, Augur is, is basically in development hell right now. And uh, if, you, if you believe Paul Stork, then Augur will never yield a marketable product um, at all because it has serious sort of foundational problems. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply skeptical of Ethereum um, I, I, I wanted to participate, you know, back in the day, and then the Dow um, catastrophe occurred, um, and I realized that they, the the foundation was not committed to running it as they had marketed it. Um, I, you know, I I believe Ethereum Classic is probably the the fairer chain of the two, 
um, and that you have to own your mistakes. And if you write a bad smart contract and you claim that you want to build unsolvable applications, then you have to own that, you know, and you can't just roll back the chain arbitrarily um, because what that does is it exposes the foundation to a lot of subsequent risk because now they're going to be asked to roll back the chain. You know, now Putin has influence over Vitalik. Um, Putin sees it as a way to uh, expand his soft power, perhaps, uh, where it might be lacking. It's, you know, a, a, a sort of centralized currency in Ethereum is is much more centralized than Bitcoin in, in every manner imaginable. Even if you look at the mining, I think that the, a couple of pools have over 51% between the two of them. Um, you look at the foundation that controls the purse strings. You look at the fact that it was a token sale, so it's much more poorly distributed. Um, in every conceivable dimension of centralization, Ethereum is more centralized than Bitcoin. Um, and um, I see it ending really catastrophically and probably with some sort of state intervention. Uh, and I, I hope um, regulators do something about it sooner rather than later. Uh, and I was surprised that the SEC said uh, okay. Ethereum is not a security because I consider it to be one, uh, even though I'm not right yeah. This has turned into a centralization talk about uh, Ethereum. I, I, I did not plan on talking that much about Ethereum today. Um, I, you know, I was talking about the newbies pumping everything up, um, but newbies don't care about centralization or decentralization. They just want to make a quick buck. And hey, ICOs are the way to go. Apparently, with that, if you want your 100% return, and I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that's what the newbies say. Um, but. Uh, Rocky, I mean, do you have any opinion on, on any of this real quick? Yeah, well, you know, like Richard said, uh, Ethereum is really only good for one thing, and that's for putting these ICOs on top of it. And with the um, Securities Exchange Commission coming out saying that these ICOs are basically illegal securities, um, uh, you know, why isn't the price of Ethereum $10 right now? I don't know. Um, you know, Wall Street has a saying about people investing in stuff they don't know about. They call it dumb money. And I would have to say there's a lot of dumb money in the crypto space. So Richard, I, did I, I interrupt you? Okay, continue, Richard. Sorry. So I, I look at I look at problems as binary. You can either deal with them now or you'll have to deal with them later and they'll be worse. So the best time to kill a monster is when it's young and weak. And the larger you let the monster get, the the less and the more and more reluctant you are to deal with it. I mean, to give you an inflammatory example, North Korea had no nukes and no way to deliver them. Now they have nukes. Now they're working on ways to deliver them. And if you chart that that out, do you wanna do you wanna wait until you can't intervene, or do you wanna like intervene now? If you watch Noam Chomsky's position on it, he says that. They, America derives some benefit from what's going on. And the analysis is so advanced that I can't do it justice here. But, but my point is that Ethereum is going to crash and you can either do it now with less pain for everybody, or you can do it later with more pain. So I made a funny image, uh, with, uh, Ethereum as like the queen, uh, the queen alien, and then pumping out little egg drone ICO aliens that, you know, grow up and attack. And so you can like either if you kill the queen, it kind of gets rid of some of those other problems. Now, that's not to say like I support having an ERC-20 analog on Bitcoin through something like rootstock or equivalent, because if we're going to have people making stupid mistakes and doing stupid things, it's better that they do those stupid things and stupid mistakes on a more secure system. So at least they're not losing $50 million to poorly implemented multisig or able to transact because Geth and Parity disagree on the state of the network because those design decisions are not getting fixed. So if, if everyone in the world's going to be stupid, then let's have them stupid on a more secure system. So I think as soon as Bitcoin rolls out side chains through drivechain.info with Paul Stork, uh, sports, or uh, through uh, Rootstock with, uh, you know, basically smart contracts on Bitcoin, either one of those should be truly damaging to Ethereum. And, and even Tezos, if Tezos works and has uh, verifiable, formally verifiable smart contracts that are less buggy, you'll still have bugs outside your test cases, but at least for what you can test, it'll be formally proven great. Even that kills Ethereum. So uh, I don't, 
I think the project's the worst. Not the worst, but bad. Hey, Richard, there's a Dan Williams in the chat. Uh, wants, he, he sent two bucks uh, through Super Chat. Thank you. He wants you to straighten your candles. He says your candles yeah, are not, I, I, you know, I know. It's your personal. I don't, I don't feel like fixing it. It's just so hard. I just want to leave it. <laughs> I, I love your background, man. I wish I, I had some candles here. Pound that like button if you like, uh, if you like backgrounds other than my own boring one here. Uh, I want to say, uh, I, let's let's move on to, from uh, getting to a little bit more of an altcoin discussion here, because everyone loves to hear about altcoins sometimes. Nick, uh, as you know, uh, we've had Bcash fork off from Bitcoin. And we've had uh, the threat of 2x doing that, and I call this uh, a, a crypto dividend. I just I just look at it as uh, three coins for those of us who hold Bitcoin. It is it is just a way. These these it's just a unique way of forming an altcoin. That's the way I like to describe it to people because people understand that these forks, although they are not friendly forks, they're not a threat to Bitcoin. They're actually something that can be looked at in a in an all right in a way to get more a way, as a way to get more of the real Bitcoin, even though they're trying to pretend to be Bitcoin. So at, at the same time, we've I've, I've discovered something called a uh, B Gold uh, that, again, which is a, a, a friendly fork of Bitcoin that's going to happen, and there there are probably going to be a lot of other altcoins forming uh, just by forking Bitcoin by forming these crypto dividends. So. I want to hear your opinion on, well, what, what do you think about these forks? Is it a trend? Is it something to be worried about? Or is it a positive? What's, what's your opinion? I think it's great that you've started a conversation about this um, because it, um, talking about dividends and cash flows, that's the kind of stuff that gets institutional finance interested. They love productive assets. And if you can make the case that Bitcoin is a productive asset, people are going to love that. Uh, you know, people, you know, the institutional money sitting on the sidelines. And that's actually what I've been working on recently. I ran the numbers, and in the last year, if you hold Bitcoin and you sold all of your airdrops, your forks, whatever, anything that's not Bitcoin that you get from owning Bitcoin, you know, we're talking Stellar, we're talking uh, Clams back in the day, and now uh, Beagle is forthcoming, and then, you know, previously Bitcoin Cash, and then you also had Byteball. If you add all those up in the last year, that's a 30% return. Um, just from holding one Bitcoin, um, just in dividends, if you sold them day one, the first time they were, you were able to sell them, right? So um, if Bitcoin's flat, a 30% yield is fantastic, right? Um, this was probably an unusual year in the history of Bitcoin because there was the large airdrop from Bcash. Um, but, um, you know, if you can begin to market Bitcoin as a productive asset, and I believe it is, because essentially what you have is these uh, these neutral um, dividend spinoffs, they run Bitcoin's network basically as it is on a snapshot and they distribute their token and then it has perceived value because be due to the endowment effect, people uh, own those tokens all of a sudden and then they believe them to have value. You know, So value is created out of thin air um, to some degree, but it, it works, right? It worked with Stellar, it's worked with Byteball, um, it maybe worked with Bcash, although that's a special case. So on the one hand, you do have those um, those neutral um, or sort of benevolent um, airdrops. On the other, you have uh, what I call a hostile spinoff, uh, to borrow the language of, of stocks. I think that's a term that I think is fairly appropriate to something like S2X, where you have a, a small group of people behind closed doors, make an agreement, uh, decide they want to alter Bitcoin. They want to alter the governance structure as well, um, so that uh, you know a select few um, make decisions that are favorable to, to whoever uh, is behind them, and uh, and you know not implement replay protection. Um, I so I think there's a distinction there. On the one hand, you've got stuff like Byteball and Stellar that run space on the network, and everybody wins there basically. Uh, Bitcoin holders immediately sell the dividend, cash it in, earn a nice yield. Um, on the other hand, you have hostile spinoffs. Um, so you, you might think of them as dividends, but you know, if you if you're worried that they're going to steal a portion of the network away, um, then you might call it a spinoff, right? Like like uh, when eBay and PayPal split, that was a spinoff. So there is precedent in the equity world. Um, if there if if the uh, the in, if the newcomer represents a threat to the incumbent, I think it's fair to call them hostile. 
Uh, Bcash ended up being uh, fairly neutral. Um, it was diffused. Um, S2X, I think, will be a harder fight. I would call it hostile, and I think that, that's probably more of a threat than a, than a dividend. Uh, well, I'll say this about 2X. I mean, the more the more uh, friendly forks that happen before 2X, I think I think it, it helps neuter what 2X is trying to do because it just shows it to be nothing but an unfriendly fork, an, an unfriendly way to form an altcoin. So mm-hmm. I, again, I, I look at these, uh, the friendly forks, I, I encourage them because I think they minimize the unfriendly forks. The friendly forks minimize the unfriendly forks. So I'm, I'm all for, it's a free country, it's a free world. People have been forming altcoins for a long time. This is a new way to form an altcoin and distribute it to, you know, to each his own. And Nick, I think it's fascinating that you are studying this. I think this is, this is great. Um, Rocky, what do you think about all of this? Um, altcoins are really just, you know, copies of Bitcoin and they change this or that parameter and, and you know, trying to make it better and, and this or that way. And um, but you, what you got to realize is it could go the other way. Bitcoin can also copy what they're doing if the Bitcoin core team, you know, or the people in Bitcoin in general see one of these altcoins has a feature that really is valuable and they want to add it to Bitcoin, it could be added to Bitcoin. So um, you got to realize it's, you know, it's a two way street. So the way I've been looking at it lately is that all these people investing in all these altcoins, they're investing in Bitcoin research. (laughs) It's a beautiful way of putting it. Richard, Bcash, 2X, friendly forks. What do you have to say? So the difference between a friendly fork and an unfriendly fork, I'm just going to say is has replay protection or not. So a fork that doesn't have replay protection causes a lot of work and effort to avoid harm on the behalf of users and of developers all around the original ecosystem. Wallets, nodes, miners, everybody has to do things to protect themselves from stupid uh, contentious forks, which Jeff Garzik apparently is okay with making contentious. Uh, there's this axis of evil out there that, uh, is promoting anything but Bitcoin. There's an axis of evil out there that wants to see Bitcoin get replaced by something they're in charge of and they brought into the world. And these guys are Roger Ver, Jeff Garzik, uh, a Maori, who goes by Daedalus on, uh, he's the guy that wrote the code for Bitcoin ABC, which is basically Bcash. Uh, who else? Jihan Wu is a a Bcash guy. Fake Satoshi, CSW is a Bcash guy. And all of these, these defectors, these guys that want to replace the real Bitcoin that you worked hard for, paid dearly for, has new developments on it every 30 minutes, has real old school, uh, cypherpunks like Adam Back who invented Hashcash and Satoshi quoted in the white paper, one of like maybe two or three humans that he quoted in the white paper. One of them's Adam Back on Bitcoin Core's team. Uh, another is Nick Zaba who coined the term smart contract. Okay. He invented it, right? He invented his own thing that would have been Bitcoin had he figured it out a little bit better. So the point is these fake everything except Bitcoin usurpers to the throne who consist of Jeff Garzik, Roger Ver, Jihan Wu, fake Satoshi, and, uh, and a Maori, you know, I'm not exactly sure what binds them together. Geographically, they're in different places. Uh, background wise, they're into different things, but some, some strange bedfellows, very bad reason causes them to want to do harm to the real Bitcoin. And, uh, that sucks because, you know, it can't, you can't kill Bitcoin. The, the money badger don't care. That's right. Money badger with an M, uh, but you can slow shit down. So, you know, more stupid and more, you know, we could be talking about something else right now instead of that. Um, I want to call those guys out for, for general suckage. And anyone that wants to look into that suckage, maybe you could convince them to be less contentious, have replay protection, and stop wasting everyone's time on bad ideas. That'd be great. 
Uh, now, as far as non-contentious hard forks, I think it's awesome. You know, if your option is to try and experiment out on some new thing, which requires a bunch of money to put uh, a bunch of people to put money into it, well, that's a costly experiment that's very likely to fail because the the set of things which fail is infinite, but the set of things which is actually an improvement is quite small. You know, that's why in medicine the first rule is do no harm because it's much easier to do harm than it is to do right. So if B Gold wants to implement uh, GPU mining on Bitcoin, to bringing it back to how I used to mine, I'm more than happy to see that. And you know, the more experiments that get brought into an ecosystem that's already well tested for security, has great wallet addressing schemes, has you know a, a ton like everything that can be good, we've got good in the security space. And you know, for experiments to launch on that more secure system, already preloaded with uh, holders and enthusiasts off of, you know, the, the mother of all good blockchains. I'm, I'm very happy to see that. So I'm, I'm all for non-contentious hard forking for experiments. Have fun. You know, just don't steal the brand. Don't steal the logos and uh, don't try and confuse people. Do your own thing. Make it special. Make it good. And uh, I wish you the best of luck. Awesome. Awesome. Hey, we have uh, reached the end of the show and I want everyone to uh, pound that like button, of course, but all our guests, you probably have conclusionary remarks, stories of the week. I know, uh, Rocky, you sent a message. You want to talk about something. So we're going to go from Nick to Rocky, and then Richard will end it up. So Nick, is there a story of the week or something you wanted to share with everyone, something that we left off or any, or if you had a, a reply to what Richard said, the, the floor the floor is yours, Nick. I agree 100% with Richard. Uh, I think these uh, basically charlatans deserve to be called out. Um, they do seek to damage the brand, to co-opt it. They believe what they're promoting is the real thing, uh, the original vision. They're wrong. Um, it's our responsibility as the arbiters of the community um, uh, and uh, you know the public faces of something which is essentially an algorithm to call them out and to stop them damaging the brand and the values, the billions of value of household um, you know, income um, and savings, which is tied up in this product. Um, what they, you know, they may believe they're correct, and that's why they're not implementing replay protection. So they, they want to destroy the, the incumbent and promote their new thing. Um, they will ultimately fail. Um, uh, so, but uh, we definitely need to hasten their demise uh, by calling them up publicly. Um, aside awesome. from that, uh, no, sorry, that was that was a great comment. I usually don't even say all those guys' names because I don't like to give them any, and I still haven't said their names. I'll let Richard say their names. But um, yeah, it's good that people understand who they are, who the bad actors are. I try to not even put them on a pedestal at all so we just forget about those dudes because the more attention some of them get, it, it's, it, it gives them this pedestal to wreak havoc even more. But hey, oh, some... Hey, someone just uh, sent 10 bucks. Thank you, Dan Williams. Average in hold. Yes, hold, baby. All right, Nick, was there something else you were going to say, a story of the week or anything like that? A couple of news items that I found funny. Um, Ethereum ETF basically withdrawn from consideration. So that's the end of that. Um, you know, no surprise there. All the objections the SEC had to the Bitcoin ETF um, applied a thousandfold to the Ethereum product. Um, so... Sorry about that, Ethereum. Um, and uh, this, these Canadians in uh, British Columbia, I believe, uh, have been granted custodial rights over Bitcoin, which means it's a matter of time until we see um, a Bitcoin product um, in Canada, which I would say is, is sort of conditionally good for the system. I know some other panelists on the show might disagree. Um, and I would say a, a, a small matter of time until the SEC gets their act together and uh, creates a, a proper Bitcoin ETF, uh, probably through Grayscale. That's my guess. So a, a few months out. Hey, hey, Nick, you referenced Ari Paul before. I just wanted to say and remind everyone he was on this show last week. So everybody check out last week's This Week in Bitcoin. Check out yesterday's show. Also, I post a new video every day. We have uh, archives here. It's great. Um, Dan Williams again in the chat. Thank you for that, uh, that $10 super chat. I appreciate that. Those fiat donations, people. All right. Let's go to Rocky here. Rocky, you uh, you had some stuff you wanted to share and some conclusionary remarks. Uh, take it away. Yes, yeah, some really good news about uh, SegWit is we got a, our first software wallet to support it, Armory, uh, earlier this week. Um, 
not a really uh, widely used wallet. Uh, they used to be bigger in this space, but then they had some issues and they're trying to make a comeback now, but they do support um, SegWit now. Um, but I'd really like to talk about Ledger for a moment. Um, maybe your connection at uh, Crypto HW Wallet has a channel to, um, to Ledger and can let them know uh, my thoughts on this, but I, I really like my Ledger. I got the Nano, the regular Nano without the S. I've had it for about two years now. Love it. It always worked perfectly. Bcash came along and they handled that quickly and well. I like the way they, they did it. But when SegWit came along, I don't like that at all. They um, Once you pick Bitcoin and then you have to pick to go into Bitcoin Legacy Wallet, or the or the Bitcoin uh, SegWit wallet, and the, and inside there they call it the Bitcoin Legacy Chain, or the the Bitcoin SegWit Chain. They're not two separate chains. That's very misleading, and we don't need any more confusion in the space. They're two separate ways of doing an address um, in the same chain. All these addresses go into the same block, and that same block gets added to the same chain. It's not separate chains. So they need to change that. Um, they need to, all the uh, um, wallet developers need to update their software and just make it simple, please. Uh, most users just want to send and receive Bitcoin. They don't need to know all the details behind it. Um, when they uh, go to send Bitcoin, they create an address. And the only thing they should see different is that there's a three in the front instead of a one. That's the only thing, you know, and maybe have in the um, in the settings have like a basic and expert mode, and it just defaults to basic once you upgrade your wallet to this this new version. And so in basic mode, that's the only thing you see different is that three instead of the one. And when you go to spend Bitcoin, it just automatically takes care of it for you. It just automatically tries to spend your legacy addresses first. And um, when those are all gone, then start sending SegWit addresses. So it's just like a slow conversion from having more legacy addresses to having all uh, SegWit addresses. Um, and then if a user you know, feels like they want more control, they could go into the settings, select the expert mode, and then they could, you know, uh, for each individual transaction they want to make or, or or transaction where they're sending, they could go in and 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 pick which ones they want to, you know, send legacy uh, Bitcoin uh, or from legacy addresses or SegWit addresses. But um, on the surface, to the average user, it should just be all seamless and all just work behind the, uh, you know, behind behind the GUI. They don't need to know really any of this. I know so many people that uh, you know drive cars every day and they couldn't tell you the difference between a crankshaft and a camshaft. Most people don't care. They just want to put gas in the gas tank and drive. Bitcoin's the same way. They just want to make transactions. Don't give them the details unless they select expert mode. Well, wow, Rocky, thank you for that insight into uh, what's going on over there at Ledger. Uh, it, I mean, it's a cool storage device and everything. I use a Trezor um, to each his own, but this is, yeah, things are things are made complicated sometimes, and, and that is unfortunate. Do you have anything else to add? Any other stories or anything like that before we go to Richard? Well, well, don't get me wrong. I love my Ledger. It, yeah. it, it's a good product. It's always worked perfect for me. Um, and and just you know, they just haven't handled this Segwit thing very well. And I'm hoping they come out with another update and and improve it. Okay, awesome. I'd like to thank again the people in the chat. Um, there's thank you, Adam, for the good work. I am new to cryptocurrency and I have learned a lot from your channel. Thank you. She sent uh, it was who who was that that sent five Canadian dollars? I am in Quebec right now. Speaking of uh, Canada, that was uh, Joe. Joe sent that, and then San also sent ten bucks. That was really cool. Okay, Richard, I want you to just tell us your whatever's on your mind now. Do you mention sure. something before? Do you have your own token coming out? What, what was that that you mentioned before? Yeah, I have a serial entrepreneur, inventor, physicist friend who's one of the smartest people I've ever met. And he wrote his own computational fluid dynamic software, which is faster and more accurate than what everyone else uses right now. There's stagnation in the space. Everyone's been using the same software for 15 years. There's a single company that's got a 90% monopoly. And, uh, you know, if you want to overcome an incumbent in something like that, 
Well, you got to use every tool you can to find advantage. And the advent of being able to create a, a giant supercomputing computational fluid dynamics network that you can just give a problem and it gives you the result faster and more accurately than the state of the art that already exists is like one of the few places where you can actually make the case for a new token. You're like, yep, it's a new network. It needs to be fast. It needs to be strong. And you know, this is what supercomputers are actually made for. So mining Bitcoin, that's not actually supercomputing. It's just doing the very stupidest, simplest math possible by design. Uh, however, doing real uh, computation, trying to predict, you know, aerosols, two-phase flow, heat, movement, turbulence, you know, all of those things, you know, that's, that's the reason everyone still uses Fortran. That's the reason uh, that we have these giant, giant, giant supercomputers is to do exactly that kind of stuff. So I love the idea of being able to have a token that, that is useful for something that's not just, you know, oh, look, a new token trade it or whatever. I love the real technical uh, necessity and breakthrough in it. So hopefully you'll be able to see a white paper within a week, I hope. Like I can at least get you the technical details on the stuff that's already built. You know, the software exists. It's not uh, vaporware. It's not, oh, we're going to build it. It already exists. It just needs a GUI and uh, a network behind it. So uh, I think uh, on Bitcoin, you're going to have confidential transactions and anonymity features built into it. And it's going to come from Bitcoin Core, and blockchains going to help build it, and they're going to support it, and they're they're real cypherpunks. And at the core of the cypherpunk ethos is user choice, user privacy, and empowering the individual, and not the state, and not the company, and not the collectivists. So real cypherpunks, they write code, and the code that they're going to write is going to be anonymity code, and it's going to go into Bitcoin. Furthermore, uh, replay attacks. If you take my speech on my network of choice that I choose to participate in and copy it and repeat it and scream it out into the world and do me harm with it, you are my enemy. If you perform a replay attack and repeat my speech to do me harm, you're an asshole and you should be punished for it. So if I were in a restaurant having a private conversation with somebody and you decided to roll up and stand next to me and listen to me and start yelling the rest of the restaurant what I was saying, you would be socially ostracized, if not worse. So I take replay attacks seriously, and I believe that they are attacks, and I think that more people should treat them as someone trying to fuck with your money. And that's, uh, you know, something that you don't do in most parts of the world. So uh, real supercomputer does cool stuff. Love it. Anonymity's coming. Replay attacks, bad. Ethereum, bad. Dump it. If you're going to buy Bitcoin, dips are a nice place to do it. And, uh, you know, I tell everyone don't trade, but if you are going to trade, do it one time and go long and that's it. So on my Twitter, I've got a link. It's like an aff link to BitMEX because they give you good margin. So you don't have to risk much on their system if they ever disappear and just take a small little bit of your stack and go two X long, five X long. And that's it. Don't ever trade again and don't panic sell and don't be dumb or, or don't trade at all. So that's all. Dude, I, I love Richard. Those are really great conclusionary points there. Um, I want to thank all of my guests for being on the show today. You're excellent. Nick was new. Richard hasn't been on here before, but everybody knows Richard. And Rocky is, of course, a, a returning guest. I want to give a, a special shout out, though, to Richard because he's been broadcasting this on his channel. And we had some amazing technical difficulties at first. I had to totally restart the show on my end. So any of you who like to see behind the scenes stuff or you like to see me panic, or you, <laughs> you, can, you, can, you can check out the replay on Richard's and you'll see everything that went down. And then you'll be amazed how smoothly this version of the show went on my channel that you're now watching in the future, no doubt, enjoying the price of Bitcoin and, and laugh and saying, oh, it was only worth $4,600 last year. And look how Adam was uh, so panicked or whatever. Anyway, so um, and I'd like to thank Michael Cotton very much. He sent me uh, two, uh, two pounds, I think, or two euros. I, everyone's been very generous today. And uh I have been a, a bit fatumled and everything, as they say in, in the Yiddish. Um, but now, hey, it all worked out well. It was a really awesome show. And it's all thanks to my awesome guest, 
I'm so proud to have the best guests in the space on this show. I try it every Friday. We're here. We'll be back at noon next Friday. Tour de Meester is going to be one of the guests. So will Tawanda Kembo. He'll be coming from Zimbabwe. So it's going to be really unique. I post a new show here every day. Obviously, we don't do This Week in Bitcoin every day. We only do that on Friday. But so, you know, keep on coming back here. If you're new to the channel, check out DisruptMeister.com. I'm Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister. Can, can I just add something? Adam, oh, yes, yes. Please, Rob. Yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know that uh, next week, Wednesday on next week, uh, um, is my next meetup. So if you're in the Southern California area, uh, it's right uh, in the upland Ontario border in the Inland Empire. And um, I've been doing this for one year now. So you can see here a history on our website here. You can see the history of the date and the price of Bitcoin. So on September 27th, last year was my first meeting and Bitcoin was $603. So if uh, anybody wants to come and you're in the area, just shoot me an email here at this address. Rocky Plumble at Outlook.com and ask to be put on the uh, user group mailing list and you will see, receive all the details on the location and time. Yeah, Rocky, sorry, I saw you put that in the side chat. I didn't see that till the very end. Also, I wanted to point out that everybody's links, pertinent links are below for the three guests if you want to further explore who they are and everything. And and Rocky's address is, is down there and everything. And I guess Richard is... Are you going to still be uh, live broadcasting after this, or is this going to end with me uh, here? I'll probably just talk to my chat in the Discord and maybe voice with them, because I'd rather turn this light off. I, I, it's hot in here. Okay. <laughs> cool, cool. I just wanted to, uh, to put that out there. Uh, Nick, any any last thing before I uh, sign it off? Um, I, uh, I think I'm doing some interesting stuff with data, so please uh, check out my website. Yeah, his Nick. link's... Can I mention, like, follow me on Twitter if you don't already. It's Richard Hart, like the one in your chest. Win. Richard Hart. Win. That's it. Yeah, and his link, his link is definitely below in, in the notes section. So check out the notes section, people. Uh, I'm Adam Meister, the Bitcoin Meister. This Meister. Remember to subscribe to this channel, like this video, share this video. Check out the notes section below. Pound that like button. Thank you, guys. We are out of here. It's Friday. Have fun. Bye-bye. All right, very good, thank you. <laughs>